and it's tearing apart the fabric of community. It's not just the victim that's the victim. It's the friends, it's the loved ones, it's the mother, the father, the sister, the children. They're the victims. Australia is under siege. I want my police station to be full of criminals. You lose your soul, you lose everything. Worse than heroin, worse than coke, worse than pot. We are the world's second highest users of crystal methamphetamine. Street name, ICE. 1.3 million people in Australia have tried ICE. Some of your friends and members of your family would have to have tried ICE. In this series, ICE Wars goes behind the headlines. Every second house is a dealer these days. All the kids are on it, it's shocking. There's messages in your phone that, that's saying that you're dealing drugs to pregnant ladies. ICE. ICE is not a drug confined to those people who others would refer to as junkies. It doesn't matter who you are, or what part of level of society we're in, lower, upper, middle, wherever, you can get hooked on this stuff pretty quick. You can't have anything. I have to take my pan bag to the toilet with me. That's how bad it is. With exclusive access to police operations. Police under arrest for the supply of prohibited drug. What's with all this cash, mate? It's not mine, I'm going to say This appears to be the barrel and a part of the stock for a shotgun. From the street. Who ran? Who ran? Who ran? Who ran? The genuine sweet prof. Oh, hello. To criminal gangs. This is a story of a drug. Alpha 21. Alpha 20. When, when did you find out you had the meth lab in your property? We see these premises explode. They're volatile environments run by amateur scientists dealing with dangerous chemicals. It's grip. Your roadside test has come back positive, OK? Six of those cars, the drivers have had to be arrested. It's a strike rate of every two and a half cars they test is a positive. And those fighting back. The community is asking for our help. The, the human beings underneath there. We need to support those people who are suffering as a community, as a country. I want you to be in charge of your life. I don't want to be in charge of your life. I don't care whatever's going to save my son's life. But I'm going to throw it at them because I don't want to lose my son. I'm certainly not going to lose him without a fight. It's tough to stop a drug manufacturing industry that can be hidden in plain sight. Much of Australia's ice is made in small labs that can be set up just about anywhere. Warehouses, sheds, apartments, the house next door. We can walk right past an ice lab every day and never suspect a thing. Police believe this house, in a quiet residential street in Sydney's west, contains a meth lab. They're very volatile situations um, and, and we can't pose that risk, so we're forced a hand and we have to move in and ensure the safety of the community. Today, they're going to shut it down. Inside a Western Sydney police station, the operation begins with an early morning briefing. The raid involves local cops, organised crime squad detectives and plenty of muscle from the operation's support group. Also up early this morning is the big boss. Chief Inspector Michael Cook is in charge of chemical operations for the New South Wales Drug Squad. This morning we're executing a search warrant. Um, at the moment we're just talking with the surveillance team that are at the location. They've been there since early this morning. Very quickly, thanks for all for coming here today and assisting us with this strike force and search warrant. Just a bit of background. 
The target of today's raid is a career criminal well known to police. And recent intelligence uh, has also indicated to us that he does have a history and tendency to uh, manufacture small amounts of prohibited drug from his residence. It does take a certain person to profit off, off someone's pain, basically. Investigators anticipate on the commencement of the search warrant that we'll at least find uh, chemicals and apparatus uh, relative to the manufacture of prohibited drug. Thanks very much, gents. When they get the all clear, just get ready. First through the door will be the tactical entry team. So what we're doing now, we're gonna bring our kit in, we're gonna start getting ready to go. Once we get the word, we're out of here. is crucial on clandestine lab raids. Too early, and the stage of manufacture won't be advanced enough to secure a conviction. Too late, and the evidence could be destroyed. Yeah, mate, how are you? Yeah, mate, uh, I'm all good. Uh, just in the last game, he's still, still out of west, mate, so we're, we're coming to you. Okay, mate, we're rolling in now, so about uh, seven minutes off. See you soon. Cheers. Bye. What a what a little cruise that could be going. Coming, coming, coming out. Destroy Ice Labs is led by the Drug Squad. They're based here at police headquarters in Parramatta. Yeah, I don't think there was anything in the house last time, just uh, in that rear shed. And meth again? Yeah. Ice is a large part of our business. There's, there's no denying that. It's a problem for us. Detective Superintendent Tony Cook and his team advise the state's police on their response to ice manufacture and distribution. It's a big property. There's lots of stored glassware there, some chemicals. The manufacture of ice occurs in all manner of premises. It, it can be in large industrial settings. It can be in residential homes, on residential streets. It can be in moving vans. We see these premises explode. They're volatile environments being run by amateur scientists dealing with dangerous chemicals. Ice can be made from acetone, which is paint stripper, toluene, another powerful solvent, red phosphorus, which is used in matches and highly flammable, lithium from batteries that will burn the skin on contact, hydrochloric and sulfuric acids that corrode metal, 
and sodium hydroxide that dissolves human flesh. You wouldn't go and drink a bottle of nail polish remover, but these are the types of chemicals that are used to make these drugs. Drug squad detective Sergeant Alison Smith and her team must track the chemicals to their source. It's easy to become passionate about the work. It's very important to me, and I think I bring a little bit of a feminine perspective to the drug squad. Sometimes women have a different way of looking at things, and sometimes we can bring a different viewpoint to a discussion that maybe the boys haven't thought of. <laughs> Being a mum, that has its benefits as well. You learn how to multitask really well when you're a mum. So <laughs> Alison and her team have the job of investigating the drug lab in Western Sydney once the tactical group have secured the house. We respond to those type of support operations almost weekly. Our numbers haven't grown significantly over the last couple of years, but what we're seeing is more complex laboratories of a larger scale. Michael Cook has no doubts about who's behind this trend for bigger ice labs. It's generally people who have money to back their processes, so it will be an organised crime group. To make their investment pay, the crime gangs need to find cooks who are skilled in working with these chemicals. Skilled cooks are very highly sought after by organised crime. We find that a lot of the, the cooks are older male Australians. The returns for the activity they undertake can result in huge profits for these organised crime groups, so they're very well looked after. That pulls them back into that activity on a regular basis. In Sydney's west, police are raiding a suspected ice lab. But the suspect is not inside. As the secondary team of officers arrive on the scene, a man wanders out of a neighbouring house and onto the property. Is he being secured? I don't know. How you going, mate? Looking for me. How you going, mate? Hi, mate. How are you? Where are you going? No, no, you're right, mate. What are you doing, mate? What have I done? Mate, I'll bring you up here. Police only find one other person inside the house. Yeah, but look, we've got the socks. You'll be right. You're a big boy. I'm a big boy, am I? Come on, Phil. Fucking camera's off. Come on, please. Come on, please. Just Detective Grace, we're just going to explain to you what's going on here today, OK? Mm -hmm. OK. We have a warrant here to search the premises, OK? It's to search the premises for uh, prohibited drugs, namely methamphetamine, and also ledgers, uh, paraphernalia, and Australian currency, OK? Right away, police can see some kind of lab inside the house. But they haven't got the suspect locked up just yet. Without the right evidence properly presented in court, their case could collapse. At the moment, we're just in the uh, early stages of the search warrant. Uh, inside the house, we have identified some chemicals and some apparatus that uh, are consistent with the manufacture of prohibited drug. Um, just from my observations, uh, the setup here is fairly typical of what we call the drug premises. Um, underneath the eave there, there's a uh, CCTV camera um, with pan, tilt and zoom capabilities. So obviously they can see directly up the street here and can see so, for instance, the police coming here today, they've got the heads up, they can flush the, the uh, drugs down the toilet. But the raid took the suspect by surprise. Finding a stash of ice on the property will give police the evidence they need to make an arrest. We found some um, ammunition. Yeah, in the, the um, garage? They've been there for years. Yep. Didn't know they were still there, didn't know nothing about them. People involved in clandestine laboratories, more often than not, you're, you're looking at people that, that have links to organised crimes. Have you ever owned any firearms? Yeah, years ago I did, yeah. Yep. More often than not, you're going to find that they are armed, whether it be with firearms, knives, 
other sorts of weapons because they're looking at protecting their own interests. It appears to be um, quite a lot of cartridges of um, 7.62 millimetre rounds. You're going to have other criminals coming to their house. Uh, you may have drive-by shootings. They're not the sort of people you want next door. They don't care about the neighbours or anything like that. They're, they're indiscriminate. They've been up there for years and years. As we're finding items of interest and like such as this, they might give a little bit away, but they, they always try and distance themselves. This appears to be um, the, the barrel and a part of the stock for a, um, a shotgun. That's the first time I've seen that. Right now, the only thing police can charge the suspect with is possession of an unregistered firearm. As more ice leaches into the community, the number of people seeking medical help has increased five times since 2010. So just relax, mate. Stir it. No, no, just slow down, just slow down. It's all right. The kind of things that people turn up with at an emergency department are often psychoses, so mental, acute mental health problems that are usually related not just to the drug, but also due to the fact that people stay up for days without sleeping, so that trips them over into some kind of psychotic or perceptual disturbance. So that, that is a common presentation. But people can also have cardiovascular problems, so problems with their hearts and strokes, problems with their brains, and very occasionally seizures too. Uh, about 25% of regular meth users will have some kind of psychotic symptoms. And they're quite visible then because they're, they're very suspicious and they may be seeing things that aren't really there, hearing things that aren't really there, feeling things on their skin, or they may be getting quite aggressive because they're paranoid. In nearby Blacktown District Hospital, Around 40% of the patients in the lockable acute side of the psychiatric unit have used ice. Mental health trauma unit manager Ash Baker is catching up with Aaron, one of his patients. Aaron has schizophrenia and is also an ice addict. So Aaron's been in uh, hospital for the last few weeks after he went to the hospital asking for help because he had ideas of wanting to hurt people. I've known Aaron since he was about 20 years of age when he first came to hospital in 2002. He's got a history of paranoid schizophrenia and, and when he's also using uh, amphetamines, ice in particular, um, has quite marked deterioration in his mental state. Hey, Aaron. How are you, Ash? Good, mate. How are you? Not too bad, not too bad. That's the way. How you been? Yeah, not too bad. Yeah? Yeah. Still using the ice. Yeah? Still using the ice, having episodes of um, my um, schizophrenia kicking in and um, you start hearing voices like that are real, like in your house or around you. Yeah. Um, and they control you, control your thoughts and your mind and your thinking and everything like that. You see, a, you see a similar face and you think that they're stalking you and stuff like that. You just get like, you get real paranoid and you get real like um, anxious to like hurt someone and, and, and um, you just need another shot to um, make it all better. So eventually do you see yourself ever stopping sort of using ice or do you think sort of uh, you may have to use it forever or? I, I, I feel like I have to use it forever. Right, okay. Is it because of that? that feeling that you get from taking it, giving that up Yeah, on. yeah, it is. OK. You're smiling when you say that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I like it too much. Do you? Yeah, I like it too much. OK. Um, but I feel like I don't want to hurt anyone. That's why I come in here. I don't yeah. want to hurt anyone. I, don't, I love kids. I don't want to hurt any kids or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, but I'm still going to stick with the ice into using it. He's got ration. that thought that, you know, ice is making him better, uh, that he's, he seems more confident and able to do things a lot more, um, which he may feel, but I guess something that he doesn't have the insight into is that that it's causing him sort of to have these paranoid ideas that people are after him and that people are telling him to become aggressive. Um, and that sort of insight he doesn't have because of his illness as well. I do have a mental illness. 
Um, it's schizophrenic. It's not because of drugs. I, don't, I use ice to have, have a good time and be good on it, you know, and, and stuff like that. Stop the ice. People reading your mind, getting in your head, playing with your thoughts. It's just stuff like that. And, and, and when I'm on drugs, I hear them more. And it's more better for me to hear the voices because um, then I know what they're talking about. They could be your friend, but then they couldn't be your friend. They could be talking behind your back or they could be, you know what I mean? Like, it's good to hear voices like that um, in, in those certain ways. Methylamphetamine hydrochloride, known as ICE. This extra strong form of amphetamine has been available in Australia since the early 60s. ICE is like nothing else. It's like a, it's like a Superman pill. If you inject it, immediately you feel a surge. Now when a roller case the first takes off, that sort of felt like, like it felt like I just felt like nothing could stop me. Like, there was no other way to put it. Like, nothing could hurt me and nothing could stop me. A really intense, all-consuming sense of euphoria. So this is what happens in the brain. It has very, very strong effects in the brain. It releases huge amounts of dopamine. It also increases sex drive. Dopamine's the pleasure neurochemical in our brain. So anything we do that's nice, we get a little squirt of dopamine, makes us feel good, and so we do it again. Methamphetamine releases far more dopamine than anything else. Some of the estimates are around 1,200% of baseline levels. It heightens the senses. I can hear better. I can see better. I felt like I could focus better. My thinking just was super clear. It took away all my inhibitions. I didn't struggle with my feelings anymore. It's, it's almost like a zone out is the only way I can describe it. It's like a drug that wants you to forget. The real danger when someone uh, takes methamphetamine is that the person becomes violent, and they become violent largely because they're paranoid. People become psychotic, um, so they experience hallucinations, delusions. Are you, are you going to lie? Try the For doctors working in hospital emergency, crystal meth is in their face every day of the week. The health workers call them ice monsters. A significant dose of methamphetamine uh, can produce all these effects because there is this flood of dopamine in the brain and it's really causing major imbalances in brain function. And brain function is fundamentally changed. You got the itches, the bugs? Not the bugs? No. Uh... So it's as if the person is living in a completely different world. That's why they can be quite unpredictable. They form these beliefs that are quite irrational and act on them. Uh, and in that case, they're, they're quite dangerous. A few hours into the raid at the suspected drug lab in Western Sydney, police find a handwritten note in the suspect's speedboat. Within the boat, so we found a, uh, looks like a, a bit of paper, trying to set up a deal where they would um, purchase pseudoephedrine, or they refer to it as pseudo, for about 70,000 a kilo, yep. and then um, sell it for considerably more. And they also turn that pseudo into the methamphetamine themselves and, and um, yeah, to sell on the street. You would think it would be uh, silly to leave a document titled to yourself, which enlists an agreement to manufacture prohibited drug. These people are often so focused on earning money and manufacturing that they'll slip up at some, some point. And it appears in this case that the occupant slipped up, leaving the letter in his boat. You don't have to say or do if you don't want to. But anything you say or do is going to be recorded for use as evidence in court. Understand? Okay. Is there I mean, anything not about not those? First time ever said, laid eyes on it. Right now, um, it's been placed under arrest by police, and that's in relation to being the position of the ammunition we saw before. 
the firearm part and also operating a drug premises, which is what we believe this is here. The cooks are making money out of the misery of the users. They're making huge amounts of money and they don't care where that money comes from. Um, I've got no, no respect at all for these people. I'm concerned that they're held up in, in their own circles as role models, I suppose. Any two-bit drug dealer wants to be a, a, a meth cook. They see the lifestyles these people live until we catch up with them, and they just want to be like them. So it, it's, it's just very annoying to see that type of activity happen. The police aren't done yet. The forensic team moves in to find the evidence to build their case. After several weeks free from meth in psychiatric care, Ash feels Aaron is well enough to return home. He's going quite well. He's um, getting put out on leave at the moment to, to trial him. But he is looking to be put on a community treatment order on Monday. So that'll see him go back into the community, but with monitored support for six months to ensure that he's receiving his medication and also to make sure that, he, that he's uh, being looked after in the community by a case manager. Uh, I've been here now around about five times, five times in hospital now. Yeah, I'm looking forward to leaving here. Yeah, I'll leave Monday. Yeah, can't wait. It's about time that I do quit and um, get some um, counselling for it and, and um, yeah, get it, get out there and start working and then, um, yeah, get another relationship and have some more kids and settle down and hopefully that doesn't come up again in my past life. Was he using again? Right. So was he aggressive? He was talking about raping women. Oh, OK. All right, so it's not looking good for him. There's no furniture in the house. Really? Oh, gosh. OK. Yeah, so he's still got those delusional beliefs about... Hmm. All right, no worries. Thanks a lot. Cheers, bye. So that was Alison, the case manager. Yep. So she went out to see him the other day and uh, he was really elevated, speaking quite rapid and talking about uh, that he's going to build all the um, townhouses around his area. So he's got yeah. those, still those same beliefs as what he's, he's got chronically. Um, but she was saying that, you know, he, he said that he has no plans of wanting to stop ice. Well, it's not very good. No. You know, it's sort of sad to see that he's back in that circle again. Yeah, I don't know what else we can do. You know, coming into hospital, he can't use, but then as soon as he's into that community, back into the environment he's using again, we'll, we'll probably go out there and have a try and see what we can do to help him. Yep, fair enough. But she said just be a bit wary. <laughs> the way that he's going, if he is continuing to use and these delusions are coming out more and more, um, and he's at risk or others are at risk, you then, yeah, would have to probably write a schedule and bring him back into hospital. Yeah, I do have the power to take away someone's freedom if I feel that they're unwell. Uh, the only person that, uh, you know, you can't do it to is your family, so... But I can schedule the mother-in-law if I need to. Uh, <laughs> she's not related. Um, but, no, but certainly, yeah, you, you can't schedule any, or, any of your uh, blood relatives. Hey, mate. Hi, sweetheart. How are you? You remember Joe? How are you, Joe? Yeah, I'm really uh, good. How are you? Good, thanks. So, have you been using ice? Um, I haven't been using ice for a while since I got out of the hospital. So, but you haven't had anything? No, I haven't had anything. Okay. Because you just seem a bit sort of. Speedy. Oh, I'll tell you the truth. Yeah, yeah. I did have some. Yeah. I, I had, I had some, I had some ice, and I had a smoker pot. Yeah. Um, to stay awake. Um, yeah. and just to listen. Um, I, I got some sleep. I slept all night. Like I can sleep while I'm on it. Yeah. But it just keeps like when I when I injected it, it keep me um 
awake but not um, So, how you're thinking at the moment? It seems like you're jumping. My thinking, through. my thinking is like I'm telling you my part of my life story. Because okay. if I'm gonna go to the jail yeah. system, I, I want to come as a forensic patient un, uh, under protection uh, yeah. in, in jail too as well. I, I've been stabbed and stuff like that down at Mount Druitt. Then I'm seeing all other people from other jails and that coming in the area, and especially rapists and murderers, and they were banging on the window telling me to get out. They use these key things, the, their pins, and they use a pair of pliers to open the front door, but this person told me that um, the photographs of your daughter's um, split head there, um, they axed her in the head. Do you notice at the moment that your thoughts, I mean, from having the a tattoo, thoughts, you, thoughts, hold on, can I just, hold on a minute, sorry. Your thoughts at the moment, like you're jumping from one topic to another topic, do you find that you, you've got a lot of thoughts happening? Maybe a type of um, a paranoia, schizophrenic type of thing um, through um, scaredness. Are you feeling unsafe here? I feel, I, I don't feel, I feel, I feel like, I feel unsafe wherever I go. Do you ever sort of get to a point though with being here where you ever think that you may want to hurt someone or because of what they may be saying or do you ever get worried that you, you're having those thoughts? Um, I do have thoughts of um, with mouthy people that want to mouth off and stuff like that. Yep. If they want to mouth off at me, right, and only believe the other side of the stories through the lies, I can do that too. And if I get violent, yeah. I'm going to smash you with something or I'm going to blow your fucking brains out or snap your kid's neck, you know? Okay. Or I'll ask your kid in the fucking head or I'll grab heaps of people running through the schools with machetes and all that and killing your kids and that. If my family's going to die and I'm getting threats and that, that's the way it goes, they would be pushed in society, yeah. I'll cut your fucking kid's head off when I walk through the streets and that. They're going to have to have army coppers and all that following me and my own family and that. Because a newborn baby, I'll stab it straight in the head. I have no feelings for, for anything. People in society that want to carry on about my kids and saying, and suck -o, that my daughter got raped. And Mary's um, saying, suck -o, you fucking dog, you know. You're not my fucking kids anyway. Some of the longer term problems related to methamphetamine use um, are to do with the neurocognitive effects in the brain. Those brain structures and function can be damaged for quite some time. Um, it takes 12 to 18 months for those brain structures to start to recover. And we don't know how long after that until they're back to baseline levels. Crystal meth causes a massive release of the feel-good neurotransmitter, dopamine, into our nervous system. But as crystal meth stops the dopamine molecules being reabsorbed, users have to use more and more and heavy users may lose the ability to feel good at all. We also need dopamine to send signals from our brain to our body in order to move properly. The effects of dopamine depletion are disastrous. You're 17 times more likely to get Parkinson's disease. And we found this in the vast majority of people who'd used um, methamphetamine. Despite the obvious terrible effects of this drug, ICE has overtaken ecstasy, cocaine and heroin as Australia's illicit drug of choice. It's second only to cannabis in popularity. At the house in Western Sydney, the suspect has been taken away. Police are carefully dismantling the ICE lab. toxic chemicals, reaction beakers, utensils and storage jars. All this is happening in the middle of a school day in an ordinary Australian suburb. What, what is concerning is you have a look at the close proximity of all these residential houses. So that's the real danger here. Um, these things are volatile, as the experts will tell you, and it doesn't take much for these things to go off. As you can see, pedestrian walkway down the side, you've probably got school children, everything like that coming and going. Something goes wrong, someone innocent gets hurt. Along with the risk of explosion and fire, meth labs release toxic fumes 
into the air. When you go into a meth lab, you'll smell a certain smell. Certain chemicals give off a certain aroma. Um, I got a bit of a whiff before of uh, something I've smelled a number of times at meth labs, and you'll get that, um, like, a caustic sort of a sweet smell. That's it, you cleared out. Officers from the Evidence Recovery Unit are testing the suspect's paraphernalia to prove the lab here is producing ice. You got some hypo? OK. So the first bottle has come back as hypophosphorus acid, which is a Schedule One precursor chemical. It's prohibited. It's not a drug, but it is an essential ingredient that you need to make methamphetamine. This key piece of evidence will be catalogued to help convict the suspect. It looks like um, some residue of uh, methamphetamine. They usually use containers to dry the product when they're manufacturing it. Uh, we're going to make sure we preserve it for prints and DNA. It's hours into the operation, and the team has dismantled some of the walls in the house. The searchers found a significant quantity of um, white crystalline powder, which we believe to be uh, methamphetamine or ice. They found it in the bathroom of the premises, hidden behind a partially formed wall. On the street, it's probably looking from about 20 grand to 30 grand worth. And uh, judging by the, uh, the chemicals and apparatuses that we've found at uh, this location already, it is indicative of, um, of a methamphetamine cook. And chances are that the, um, the product that we did just seize was made at this premises. Caustic, flammables, acid, Iodine. Alpha 21, Alpha 20, and Alpha 19. The chemicals and hardware collected at the raid in Western Sydney, and more than 100 others each year, end up in this secure warehouse. This is the first time cameras have been allowed inside. Every time there's a clandestine laboratory located in New South Wales, the drug squad manages all of the exhibits. There's a lot of exhibits that are collected and these exhibits can't be stored at a police station because they're contaminated. Um, because it's flammable liquids, um, can someone put a tie cam on and put the APR on to open that one? Yeah. Detective Sergeant Alison Smith has a degree in oh, applied yeah, science. So my role is to keep a record of what's on hand, but also to make sure that we can get rid of those exhibits because it costs money to hang on to these things. So we're going to have to mark each item off independently. Okay, I... 005. Yep. All the evidence, including toxic and explosive materials, must be safely stored until the cases pass through the courts. If people could only see the ingredients that go into making this, some of these chemicals are disturbingly toxic to human consumption. My first ice bus was quite large. It was residential. Um, there were children living in amongst it. It was dirty, it was dangerous. These people, this is their lifestyle. They think nothing of exposing their own children to these toxic environments. And it's quite, quite sad to see from an investigator's point of view that um, these kids really, they're, they're not given the best start in life. They're exposed to things that they shouldn't be exposed to. But it's not just the chemicals. There's meth lab hardware to dispose of too. These were found in a large scale manufacture process in Western Sydney. They weren't produced necessarily for drug manufacture, but they can be used in drug manufacture, so they would have legitimate uses. When a large scale meth production line is shut down, police often find thousands of litres of byproduct that needs disposing of safely. Some of the common meth cooking techniques produce waste solution that contains lead and mercury. We've had instances where we've had thousands of litres of waste tipped into local creeks, uh, and it's been the responsibility then of local council authorities to clean that up, costing hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
Sometimes we just seat loaded in 44 gallon drums and dumped on the side of the road. Um, in each of these occasions, councils generally are required to respond or the EPA and clean up the mess that's there, but there's always a, a significant cost associated with cleaning up those type of things. The residues from a meth lab can hang around for years and years. A lot of caustic or acidic chemicals, a lot of unknown chemicals go into the water table. Meth cooks have been known to dump waste from a moving vehicle onto public roads. When the labs move on, they leave a toxic reminder. When I first met my tenant, I didn't think there was anything wrong with him. He seemed to be nice. He didn't sleep a lot. He was up all night rummaging around downstairs. And, and then I was noticing a strong smell like vinegar-like smell. But because he said he, he was a chef, I didn't take any further notice, although in my head I thought, that's not something you would like to eat. It smelled a little bit strange and strong. The meth lab in Annette Harloff's Sunshine Coast granny flat is one of the 3,707 detected across Australia in the five years to 2014. Every one of them is a serious health risk. There's not enough information out there to explain to people and get people to understand that um, there is contamination left behind and it's actually not safe to live in these houses, even though you can't see it. It's not safe. The same as we look for asbestos and we look for lead paint on a house, we should be looking for methamphetamine. The main thing that's left behind is actually methamphetamine, the drug itself. It hangs around for a long, long time. It seeps into all the furnishings. It gets all through your air conditioning. So as soon as you turn your air conditioner on, it's just putting methamphetamine around your house. The common health effects that we're seeing are respiratory problems in children, so they develop asthma-like symptoms. They've never had asthma before. They experience ADHD type of behavioural changes. Um, some of them are a little bit different from that. Some of them become a little bit more aggressive in the house. Toxicologist Jackie Wright recently investigated a family who lived in a meth lab site for two years without knowing the danger. We've actually done hair testing for that whole family to see how much methamphetamine has actually got into their body while they've been living there. And for the younger children, the levels that we're seeing are the same as low-level adult drug users. So it's not a small amount. So this is the granny flat that we rent out underneath our house. My bedroom is above this kitchen here. So when he would do his cooking here, he would open his window, of course, to let the fumes out. And I would have my window open in my bedroom all night. And so the fumes went out this window right up into my window and I inhaled them all night. I had some psychotic episodes during the time that my tenant lived downstairs. And I had a very heavy anxiety attacks that happened to me on the highway while I was driving the car. I was thinking everybody would come and kill me. I then was very disorientated and I, I went into the roundabout the wrong way. I didn't know it was a roundabout. I didn't know how I got there. And I was like, what is so wrong with you? And now in hindsight, it turned out that by cooking that stuff up at night in that kitchen, he poisoned me with that. The Australian Crime Commission asked Jackie to develop a guideline for safe levels of exposure to meth residue. So part of my research involved going and actually talking to the cooks in prison to actually better understand the things they do inside a house when they're cooking and the way they treat chemicals that can result in contamination. So it's not like Breaking Bad where they're wearing all their protective stuff and they store everything nicely in the house. None of that goes on. <laughs> they really have no perception about the damage that they may cause to other people and what they may leave behind. None of them considered 
that they left behind a problem. Jenny Boimel runs a company that teaches professionals how to clean up after meth labs. When, when did you find out you had the meth lab in your property? There are a huge amount of labs out there and on the whole, they're not remediated. I, I can guarantee you that out of the 600 plus meth labs that are discovered every year, there's only a small fraction that are professionally remediated, which is a concern. Exactly how the chemical cleanup should be done and whose responsibility it is to ensure it's done properly is a grey area. This property was busted by police about six weeks ago and after they were finished they put that sticker on the door and the council is supposed to notify the owner. The owner then needs to organise for a qualified person to test it to see how much contamination is left behind. A cleaning company then will come in and clean it and then there'll be some more testing done to check to make sure it's clean enough and safe enough for people to live in. None of that seems to have happened in the six weeks since it's been busted. That's common and quite often it may not happen at all. Unfortunately what commonly happens is councils don't want to take responsibility for the, the meth lab. They don't notify the owners at all, so they just sit on the information. The big issue with meth labs is that people don't know that a property has been used as a meth lab. Often what happens is, you know, people will move into a property, it's not disclosed to them that it was a meth lab. They notice that some of them are getting quite sick and they can't work out what's going on. And then they start talking to their neighbours, was there anything here? Oh, Actually, yeah, there was some sort of raid on this property and comes back, this property was used as a meth lab and then they trace it back and realise, well, no, remediation didn't actually take place. In Annette Harloff's case, it was clear the lab needed to be cleaned up, but she wasn't happy with the official advice. The drug squad came in, in protective suits and went in and, and seized all the material they found and took it away. And then one of the officers talked to me, handing me the leaflet and said, you will have to have that place cleaned up. Just wipe everything three times. And then I said to that officer, I think we should have a professional company come in to do this. And the officer then said to me, that will cost you thousands and thousands of dollars. It's not that bad, dear. Just wipe everything three times. Jenny Boimel runs a reputable training company, but finding a contractor who's squeaky clean can be a challenge. This business at the moment is run by the mafia. That's the way I look at it, because there is no guidelines. Hygienists are out there demanding astronomical prices for testing, and the testing is so simple. I'll give you an example. I've got two hygienists in my mind right now. One person charged $16,000 for initial testing, another hygienist quoted $2,800 for the initial testing. They're doing the same job. So this is the test kit that the forensic cleaner um, brought out here. And uh, he did all the testing and everything came below the legal limit. But we decided still to go ahead and have this kitchen cleaned up forensically. We did that voluntarily. We didn't have to do it, but we did it so that the kitchen is really, really clean. In Blacktown, Aaron is back on the ice. Mental health unit trauma manager, Ash Baker, has called an emergency meeting to discuss what to do next. So we went out and saw Aaron, and he was grossly thought disordered, tangential. He has used ice, he has used pot. He's quite paranoid about other people. Um, Consultant psychiatrist of the crisis about, team, really, really Dr Gaurav Tandon, is considering options for Aaron. Can we safely, I haven't seen him, you've seen him, can we safely say give him some medications today? Yep. Monitor, and let's go, whatever time we go and home visit him, see him tonight, see him first thing again, yet again tomorrow in the morning, yep. and take it from there. No, no, no. The team no, no, no. needs to balance Aaron's freedom against concerns for community safety. In hospital, there's one-way path. We know exactly what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Absolutely. He would be secluded. He'd be and getting he's, in. He's agreeable to take a lanzapine. Yes. We spoke to yeah. him about that. So. I'm happy to give that a go. Okay. I mean, again, we'll in the 14 in the years the Ash has known Aaron, there have been no violent incidents. In and so the decision is made to leave him in his home. I've got some pleasant news for you. But Dr. Tandon decides to send a team of care workers right away with strong sedative medication. This job, you, you create thick skin, you know, to be able to deal with what you see every day. Some of the things that you go out there and see in people's homes, you, you can't possibly fathom, like it's, it's disgusting. Previously, I was supposedly quite a sensitive person, um, but now the wife says, you know, that I've toughened up a fair bit. I've had to do that to survive this role and do this job, because if you don't have a good coping strategy to deal with all these hard things that you see, you won't last. And they're, they're people, they're, they're human beings underneath there. My hope is that you can find that in everyone, and I really do strive to find that. For so long, a lot of people look at the negative side of things, and if you change it around to what's actually positive in your life at the moment, try and find at least one thing to, to grow on, it can really help them. That's the way. There's no lights on. Yeah, yeah, I'll put some lights on. Yeah? I don't know what he's doing in that house. He doesn't use the electricity, there's no TV there. You know, it's indicative of the only thing for him to, to do is probably use drugs. So what's your plans tomorrow? My plans tomorrow? Yeah. Um, just kick back at home and relax and go see my mum and um, say hello to my mum and just think about what I want to do for a career in life and... Um, Good. Have a good time. Can Thank you, you very much. Can you hold hand for out that. like that for me? Thank you. OK, so it just helps your thought processes. And sometimes when you've had the paranoia about people, yep. it helps with that. Yep. I think something, Aaron, I guess, that we've really, really got to make sure that we can try and help you out with is that ice can create and make these paranoid feelings worse for you. Um, um, I'm paranoid without the, without yeah, the no, ice. But ice, but it makes ice makes it worse. It worse. Aaron doesn't believe that ice is doing anything wrong. He actually thinks ice makes him better. But yeah. the ice you don't hang out from, or the ice, it's just like a hormone type of thing. Yeah. Through sedative, through hormones, and um, and even when you're on ice, you get to still get a good night's sleep because um, the purity of the ice that I get doesn't make you scatter out, or it doesn't make you see things. Or it's not always about the drugs or anything yeah. like. That's why I told you. Yes, yeah, I do use ice. Right. And when you it's extremely it, difficult because. Aaron thinks ice is the thing that's going to make him feel better. And then when you're trying to help someone that doesn't have that insight, it's virtually impossible to try and then get them to a place where they're going to be able to understand that ice is actually creating this paranoid thoughts, making this sort of internal rage that he's got going on when he becomes unwell. Yeah. I like to just to be left alone and be left in, okay. in and make sure my family's OK, you know? I had a lot of friends. I got a, I had a lot, a lot of friends okay. Okay. and stuff like that. And, okay. and thanks for your help anyway, guys. No, no that's worries. all right. It's so not we'll a come and... Thank you. OK, it's so tomorrow, OK? No problems. Thank right. you, guys. Thank right. you. Have a good night. Yeah, you too, mate, OK? See you, guys. See ya. Aaron did really, really well after we saw him. We linked him in with an ongoing caseworker and community support worker. Um, unfortunately, he did relapse. Uh, he had about a month of mission. But, you know, I, I think he's staying out of hospital longer, which is good. He's come a long way. He was in hospital for months on end, and now he's actually being able to stay out. He's re-engaged with his family again. Um, and he's doing quite well. When he's really well, he's well. You know, it's just unfortunate when he takes the ice, he just goes backwards a bit. Since Aaron's return to the community, he got into trouble. He is now in jail for armed robbery.
next time. Welcome to Operation Iceberg. The community is asking for our help. As ice spreads from the cities to the country. The way Wellington is, every second house is a dealer these days. All the kids are on it, it's shocking. Small towns are fighting back against the scourge. I want my police station to be full of criminals. I want them locked up and off the streets. A mother's anguish. He has taken something like $25,000 off me. I have to take my pan bag to the toilet with me. That's how bad it is. And roadside testing yields frightening results. We've tested 15 cars, and six of those the drivers have had to be arrested. Drop rate of every two and a half cars they test is a positive. Does she know that you use ice?